Hey there, hackers! Welcome to Tacit Sanctuary. I am bringing you the joy of programming in Tacit style using the Viva programming language. This channel is for you if you already have some programming experience and you want to expand your horizons. Maybe you are a student of computer science or a professional software developer, or just a hobbyist like myself who enjoys exploring new ideas. You might be wondering why you should care about the Tacit style. What is Viva anyway? And why would you want to spend time learning an unknown kind of esoteric language that hardly anyone uses? But hear me out, I will give you the reasons with a quick intro to the background of this exciting language and then I will show you the essence how to use it. There are many different coding paradigms, such as imperative, object-oriented or functional style. Now the question is, what is Tacit style? And what kind of problem does it solve? Essentially, tacit in programming means that we are not using any variables. Hence, I argue that it solves one of the most difficult problems, as per Phil Carton, having to come up with meaningful names. If we check the dictionary, the meaning of the word tacit is wordless, silent, unspoken. Actually, there is this popular idea about the iceberg of knowledge, where the smaller top part above the surface represents the explicit knowledge, anything that is written, documented or explained. But the large part hidden below is the implicit or tacit knowledge, or experiences, skills, cultural backgrounds, best practices and wisdom accumulated over the years. It's such a beautiful metaphor. However, in programming, it means something slightly different I'm going to show a simple example in three different languages. Don't worry if you don't actually know these languages, the syntax is not really the point here. The idea is how we can make the names disappear. The first one is in Haskell, a functional language. This code will take a string, keep only the uppercase letters and remove the rest. So essentially, this is a filter operation. The last line is a function declaration, where text is the name of the argument. Because of Haskell's unique syntax, we are allowed to remove the text from both sides of the equal sign. I argue that this code is more beautiful and easier to read, very clear, and we do not need to invent any names for arguments. In Haskell, this is also referred to as point-free style, and you can go a long way to turn most of your code point-free, but it can have a bad impact on readability if the code is slightly more complex. Okay. But can we do this in more mainstream languages? Let's have a look at Kotlin. This time, I will focus on the lambda function inside the filter. Here, the variable c refers to the single letter inside the string. And we can simplify the expression by exploiting Kotlin's syntax sugar for the implicit it keyword. Or we can go even one step further and just use a method reference notation rather than applying a lambda. And we could even do a similar trick with C Sharp or Java. This way we can totally avoid inventing variable names. Or can we? Actually, I was cheating here just now, because we still have a function argument here called text. But in Kotlin, we can even get rid of this one by converting the function to an extension method of string. This time we are invoking the filter on an implicit this that refers to the object from the context and it can be omitted. Now the solution looks very much like Haskell version. No names at all. Now let's have a look at something more exotic in BQN. Here's a really short summary in case if it's your first time seeing this language. BQN is a modern array language following the traditions of APL and J. Its built-in functions are single character symbols. A function can have either one or two arguments so based on the number of arguments, we call it monadic or dyadic. We can declare a function with the curly braces. The double stroke x refers to the argument, which is a string, in other words, an array of characters. We can determine if a character is uppercase by comparing it to a and z, then combining the result with the minimum function. Finally, we take this binary mask and apply it to the original string as a filter, using the replicate function, which is the slash symbol. So this is the explicit version, where the argument x is mentioned multiple times. Now tacit style is really a strong point of BQN. In the tacit version, 
you notice that the curly braces are gone. All the axes are gone and instead we have these before and after combinators. Again, the point right now is not to analyze and understand the code in detail, but instead the takeaway is that the tacit style lets us get rid of the arguments. In case of BQN, even though the code is shorter, but in my experience overusing the combinators can lead to code that is more difficult to read. So, what have we learned so far? To be fair, saving a few keystrokes may not be a huge advantage, but the real deal is how we think about solving problems when using TASIS style. We can prioritize function composition and think in data pipelines rather than worry about naming some temporary variables. The human mind has a finite and very small buffer. If you haven't heard of the magical number 7, look it up in Wikipedia. It is a fundamental idea in modern psychology. Having to worry about one less thing to keep in your head can let you focus on the important stuff and ultimately lets you achieve a huge productivity boost. Before arriving at our final topic, a quick tangent about mathematical notations. If we think about it, notation is a huge mess and reading math formula is a delicate art. Not only have we prefix, infix and postfix notation, but more complicated ways to write things such as sums or integrals that are very difficult to replicate in a text editor. But how do we represent the same in code? In terms of the math and logical operators, most programming languages have been following the traditional notation and use a plethora of prefix, infix and postfix styles. What we see more consistently is the function invocation that is typically prefix. On the other hand, the rise of OOP has also made the object.method invocation style very common, with the method name wedged in between the object and the argument. The Haskell and Lisp functions also follow prefix notation. On the other hand, in array languages such as APL or BQN, the infix notation became the norm, putting the function in between the two arguments. We can observe this only in rare cases in mainstream languages such as Python or Kotlin. The matter of all array languages APL actually started out as a unification attempt for math notation, way back in the 1950s by Ken Iverson. Only later in the 60s was it developed to a computer language. Even the name literally stands for a programming language. True story. What's common about these languages and sometimes even just libraries such as NumPy. The core data structure is the multidimensional array. But if this stuff is so old, why does it matter today? Actually, this is the case with many, many trendy things about computers. They were already discovered decades ago, but suddenly they are significant again. Arrays are important in processing huge amounts of data, for example in statistical analysis and artificial intelligence. With distributed computing, multiprocessing and modern GPU that can execute many parallel operations, these topics are again in high demand. Learning how to manipulate and process large blocks of data effortlessly is going to be a valuable piece of knowledge in the years to come. Ok, but why Viva? Some keywords from the Viva website, the most curious one for me is beautiful. The language designer puts a large emphasis on aesthetics and ergonomics. Also, some other array languages lead us to writing code that is hard to understand, even for ourselves after a few days. But the main goal of Viva is to create readable programs. There are only a few very simple rules. Once you learn the symbols and the algorithms behind, you can easily use them as the fundamental Lego bricks to build even complex stuff. As for me, I managed to solve the majority of the advent of code problems with it. If you want to try it, there is an awesome tutorial on the website and an interactive editor. Let's have a look at those symbols first. Each of them has an actual name, so you can simply just type its name in the editor, even the first few letters are enough, and the auto formatter will handle it for you. The colors also have meaning, they indicate how many arguments are consumed by the function, usually 0, 1 or 2. Some of them take another function as argument too. Let's play around a little in the online editor. Viva is a stack-based language, which means that the program execution and the flow of data is all guided through the global stack of values. 
At first sight, it seems to apply prefix notation like Lisp. For example, we can add two numbers like this. However, it is in truth a concatenative language. The code execution is flowing from right to left. Values are added to the stack, then consumed or transformed by functions. Array-oriented means that many operations apply very naturally to arrays. For example, we can multiply a number with all elements of a matrix, or we can add two arrays as long as they have the same shape. You can learn all the related rules from the tutorials. There are only four data types, numbers, complex numbers, characters, and arrays. Let's try an easy one. To calculate factorial, we need to multiply all numbers from 1 to x. For example, factorial of 5, we create a range of 5 numbers. We have to add 1, so that it starts with 1 and includes 5 as well. Now we have an array of numbers, we can reduce it with the multiplication operator, and we have the factorial already. If we just remove the argument from the end, and assign this expression to a name, we already have a function declaration, and we can use it anywhere in our program later. I will post more practical videos about how to build programs with Viva, so stay tuned. If you are interested, then please like, subscribe, and give me your opinions in the comments. See you next time.